thank you for coming uh, and thank you for holding this lecture for us. Uh, it's a pleasure for us. I think uh, Deklava Grigoric is one of the shooting stars of Slovenian architecture, but also now in the international Liga, and so I'm happy that you have time, and it's yours. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Volker. Voila. So, uh, first, thank you very much for uh, this invitation, uh, Volker. I think it's uh, really a pleasure to be in Vienna again. Uh, this time to share with you our work and how we progress in making architecture in our relatively small architectural studio. But also thank you for coming here to this event. Nowadays it's very difficult to organize uh, such events uh, to be in live version, but I think it's very rewarding also for the speakers in general to speak to, to, to the real public. I think that's quite... I mean, we've learned with all the Zoom era that the uh, public is kind of necessary to communicate with. So, um, before uh, I go to introduction of the office, I would like to just kind of run you through the, the, the quick overview of what I'm going to speak today about. So I'll do the introduction and then uh, an, a little research project. And then I kind of packed four projects per topic. One is experimenting on homes, and the other one is improving society. And I'll, I'll end up with, uh, with a learning from our built buildings, which is, uh, which is the research on nanotourism that we are doing um, for the past seven years. So, uh, yes, again, uh, Tina Gregoric is my partner. We are a leading studio together, and she is as Volker has mentioned, uh, teaching at the uh, TU Wien. She couldn't come today, so she's, uh, she's sending best regards to all of you. Uh, it happens that we are uh, receiving uh, one of the uh, local awards in uh, Ljubljana for one of our projects, Home et Resonale, that I'll also show. Uh, so we kind of divided our uh, pleasures uh, uh, to be speaking here and receiving the award. Uh, our practice runs since 2003, and we are a relatively small architectural practice. We've never been bigger than 10 architects, but only architects. Um, and we kind of work mostly in Slovenia, but we also have some projects abroad. So this is uh, the diagram, a sketch of a cloud where uh, the two of us are kind of involved. Uh, we try to kind of map up what we are really doing. And we figured out that teaching, practice, and research, uh, although they might seem to be different fields, they very much intertwine uh, between each other, and they produce this kind of cloud of operations. Uh, at the same time, this is uh, a timeline where it where, where shows kind of our uh, way of working as, uh, as, as the office. This is kind of a... The, 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 you know, the line in between, but um, you know, the teaching and the, the, the research, research kind of ending up in publications, the teaching being, uh, being either in TU Wien or at the AA when I'm running the AA Nanotourism uh, visiting school, it's kind of intervening in between uh, the built work. So I need to show this slide. I mean, you all know and are aware about this, but I would like to say that Ljubljana and Slovenia are positioned on the crossroads of Europe, um, in between East and West, and of course also between North and South. And throughout the history, we've been part of uh, political uh, and diverse cultural backgrounds. I mean, uh, starting with uh, Roman Empire, Ljubljana, Emona was kind of first uh, Roman settlement. And then uh, Napoleonic uh, Illyrian provinces, uh, of course, Venetian Republic, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire that we all share uh, in our history, and this uh, kind of social political experiment of uh, Yugoslavia for 60 years. So um, we, are, we, we have all these kind of layers being there in our, in our um, uh, area that speak about uh, our past and the very diverse cultural um, effects that we are kind of consuming uh, while living there. Uh, so our cultural milieu, milieu is also kind of very fixed on, on where you can travel by car. And today when 
taking an airplane is kind of really difficult. The <laughs> what you reach with the car, it's kind of important. And, and that you can be in five hours in Milan, three hours and a half in Vienna, in split in four and a half hours, reaching you know, some most beautiful islands in Europe. It defines also uh, our way of uh, thinking and working as architects. Um, so it is contextually diverse from Mediterranean to the Alpine. And as it was pointed out in a detailed magazine, uh, we kind of strive to conceptually develop each project as a unique response to a specific context. And that context can be either spatial, material, historical, typological, climatic, etc. And uh, therefore, we are not really developing a style, but rather a systematic design approach. And if you want to kind of see this uh, photo diagram of the buildings we've built uh, up till now, a selection of those, the buildings vary uh, very much in appearance, but they all come down to the same, in a way, process of thinking. And we very much operate with sketching, which is, in a way, a tool for thinking. But at the same time, we also work as a, as a group, uh, first as a couple, and then as a group is, uh, is in the office. And we use m r regular modeling as a tool of discussion. So at the end, we are constantly asking ourselves the question of how to challenge the obvious and how to act beyond the standard. Um, so there are no standard situations and therefore there should not be any standard solutions. Uh, one very important thing is that we very much kind of uh, see the architecture being a discipline characterized by materials. And challenging those materials with exposing their primary natures is one of our focuses. As well as the architecture as experience. We think that at the end, the architecture does not really exist uh, if there are no users to, to use this, the people who are actually inhabiting this architecture. So the user is the main uh, focus of uh, how we do architecture. And the third set of, uh, of, let's say, what defines us as architects is our architectural legacy that we have in Slovenia. Of course, starting with Plechnik as kind of the, the, the father or godfather, if you want. And then moving back, uh, further down to, to uh, Edvard Raunikar, who in a way kind of established the school of architecture as we know it today, although it was before, but as a school of thinking. And then a series of... Uh, his contemporaries, a little bit younger, modernist architects that have uh, made modernism contextual in a way for Slovenia and quite different than the one you can find in uh, other countries around Europe. So just to show you a couple of images, you know this building is a university, university national uh, library. Um, but uh, you also know this one, which is the, 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 the two towers in the center of Ljubljana of Edvard Raunikar. And somehow you can trace back what Raunikar was doing as a modernist through Plechnik back to uh, Otto Wagner and the Viennese uh, school. So in a way, this kind of genealogy is linked to here where we are sitting today. Uh, and of course, even back further on to the theory of the material exchange with God, of Gottfried Semper that you can read in the buildings of Raunikar and other modernists still in, uh, in the modern buildings today in Slovenia. That's an example of uh, Otto Jugovets, a, uh, a holiday home kind of compounded out of two prefabricated uh, trusses of the bridge for the roads, but being kind of thrown into a, con into a context of a rural environment with a double-pitched roof. Or another example from Otto Jugovets, where the roof was a project to protect archaeological remains in the middle of the field, using only rural traditional materials, but with an inventive contemporary structure to provide the minimal impact on the ground. And another very important architect, and when I started to study architecture, I was part uh, of his studio in the architecture school in Ljubljana, is Stanko Kristel, um, who brought, in a way, the humanism into Slovenian modernism. This is a kindergarten, scaled and structured to fit the perception of kids. And another building uh, where clearly shows the authority of structure, uh, that structure becomes architecture and crea creates the narrative of the building's uh, program. So all of these, they were, they were also exhibited, or most of these projects were also exhibited uh, in the recent uh, um, 
international exhibition called Concrete Utopia in uh, MoMA in New York, New York. So let's start with the project. So I've um, well, the, the, the home. Home is a very important topic for architects as it's kind of prevalent uh, built structure. And uh, we had an opportunity uh, to be selected, uh, Tina and me, as the curators for the Slovenian National Pavilion for Venice 2016 Biennale, when Alejandro Alavena was uh, the main curator. And as you know, we don't have actually a pavilion per se as a house, but we were hosting within the Arsenale building. So that's uh, the home in Arsenale. So um, there are several frontiers that need to be expanded to improve the equality of the built environment and consequently people's quality of life. Um, this is what Aravena was kind of giving us to, to, to show how we can improve the quality of life. And, and, and we kind of took this quote, but also his work in housing, um, uh, referring to Quinta Monroy, uh, where he was doing this kind of half of a good house. Um, and, and we um, understood that to improve the majority of built environments and to improve the quality of life, we have to improve homes, the structures of dwelling. So why home? Since the dawn of civilization, the structures for dwelling have constructed predominant part of our built environment and have served to fulfill the most basic needs of humanity. But yet they should aim uh, just more and beyond securing mere environment, mere survival, uh, and they should aim to provide uh, you know, the conditions necessary for a meaningful life. So definitions of homes uh, of home have been continuously questioned and challenged within diverse historical and cultural uh, settings. Uh, and today's information-driven society is characterized by accentuated and proliferated mobility. Um, and mobility ranges from seeking permanent relocation uh, or to various commuting scenarios, as for instance Tina is doing from Vienna to Ljubljana and back and forth. So one of, the, one of the collaborators in our project said also that the home is where the Wi-Fi is, which becomes, became kind of really true with the corona uh, quarantining. So the project Home et Arsenale is a proposal of a concept of a home as a public curated library that operates as a platform for exploring the notions of home and dwelling within the current critical social and environmental conditions. So we've done a one-to-one -one scale spatial structure, an abstract of uh, a home performing as a curated library during the biennial uh, of 2016 in Venice. So uh, there, were, there is a library, there are books, and there was the structure that we kind of constructed in Arsenale. So that was the concept that we have found, and the rooms uh, within the Arsenale that you are all familiar with, they look like this. They are somehow plastered with, uh, with the plasterboard walls to be performing as kind of a white box, but in reality it contains quite a lot of uh, texture, and you see that kind of window was already cut uh, out from the previous uh, intervention, and we understood that as a really important context, so we kind of took the opportunity to bring that window in the project itself. So at the end, we kind of use our given space into two different, uh, two different uh, spaces. We kind of divided it in half. We, as I said, cut out the window to let the light in, and we built up the pavilion to hold the books, um, and we left the half of the space empty to, in a way, perform as a square, as a patio. And by doing this, we remembered a patio and pavilion uh, project from Ellison and Peter Smithson that they were proposing in 1956 for the, uh, for the exhibition, uh, I think it was Future House. Um, and they have said the following, patio and pavilion represent the fundamental necessities of the human habitat. The first necessity is for a piece of the world, the patio, and the second necessity is for an enclosed space, the pavilion. So we undertook uh, a very kind of a specific design of uh, how to kind of create that uh, built structure there. And we approached it into constructing kind of an endless 
shelves for books being composed out of horizontal elements and out of vertical elements. Simply using uh, a very uh, simple element of wooden planks to be kind of put together in a, in a three-dimensional, compact, uh, structurally stable um, construction or a structure. So it kind of looked like that. Um, it, it kind of filtered the views and the light coming in. Um, but why wood? Uh, first, the material definition of the installation is reflecting the historical linking of Venice and Slovenia. Since the wood from Karst region and also some parts of Dalmatia was used extensively for the foundation on the, of the city of water, specifically the oak trees. But also, wood represents Slovenia's primar primary resource and therefore opens up uh, its underused potential as a construction material for domestic spaces. Furthermore, using and representing the, the wood, it's in raw condition, highlights its properties and textures. So by opening up the, the window, the light kind of created the cavity from where we started to kind of to place the books that were the main evidence of the exhibitor's contribution. So how we came to uh, kind of create the curated library of the books on the notion of home and dwelling. We invited artists, uh, architects, critics, curators from various backgrounds uh, to be participating in their own selection of roughly 10 books addressing the notions of home and dwelling to share their experience and expertise for their fronts um, in order to build the curated library. So we asked them, please give us the best books you think they are representing what the home is today or from history. We represent some books from your own environment, from your context where you're coming from, and some of your own books that are representing your own work. So the list of, uh, of uh, invited uh, Participants, it's, it, I think it numbers like to 27 uh, different professionals. As I said, not only architects, but also writers. As an example, uh, a design critic, Alice Rostorn, or uh, Konstantin Gercic as, as a furniture designer, as he is also, in a way, with his work defining the, what home is. And we ended up with these kind of piles of books that we went out and bought almost all of those books from eBay, Amazon, uh, bookshops, uh, different kind of more obscure auctions and so on. So we, we ended up with this kind of pile of, uh, of uh, books f belonging to specific uh, author, uh, well, participant who was selecting these ones, in order to uh, kind of put together this um, around 300 books curated library that represents in all possible way of what the home is. And they are not only books on architecture, they are variations of books from novels to the books for children. Um, in addition to that, this kind of home at Terzenale as a curated library also became an event space or a home for one day for each of the uh, participants that were participating to this uh, uh, library. So here you see a selection of uh, people that have been creating um, uh, that we have kind of made the interviews with them and it's going to kind of end up in a book that is still in the production or events that uh, have been kind of organized throughout the, the, the biennial um, in, in the context of each individual uh, participant that could do whatever they thought it was kind of relevant to discuss uh, home. So it was a structure like this. It had to kind of perform as in any exhibition where there is a number, a million of things that you have to see, it had to perform in two seconds, like visually, so sort of attractive, but you could also spend there uh, maybe like up to two hours or three hours browsing uh, the books. And um, so many uh, architects, our colleagues, which we highly uh, uh, value and, and appreciate, they came in and although they are super knowledgeable, they kind of discovered a book or two that they didn't know about. So this was, in a way, a very good uh, feedback and a pleasure uh, of, of ours. So events from architectural to the student events, when this kind of structure performs as an amphitheater, and uh, very importantly, um, also the space for kids, as the Venice Biennial is 
an event that kind of tends not to be only for professionals, but for general public. You know that there are a lot of schools going in, uh, and also kids of uh, you know kind of young or semi-young architects that they kind of drag them along to all of the exhibitions. So this has to perform also for them. So the the pavilion as such as the wood, we kind of put it together. It's kind of zero waste concept, and we brought it back to Ljubljana, as well as books. So most of the budget, which by the way, it's the same amount that the Republic of Austria is spending only for the opening, went into buying those books as the, as the main kind of knowledge that we kind of bring back to the Museum of Architecture and Design in Ljubljana, and that was a version of that same material and these books being exhibited in a, in a, in a temporary stop at the Bio uh, 26, the Biennale of Design uh, last year that was in Ljubljana. So now all of these books are made there being uh, in the museum for public use. Okay, so home as an experiment uh, is the other way how we learn of doing homes. And I, Usually we, we don't uh, really show this project anymore because it's, uh, it is, uh, I think, old 20 years, or a little bit more than, uh, less than 20 years. It's the first project that we, uh, that Tina and I have designed together as, as a couple with a very, very small office. Maybe there was another person involved in the whole office back then. And, uh, and it's, it's an urban holiday home for my parents. So in a way it was kind of a, one-to-one -one doing by uh, learning by doing experimentation of what the home really means and what architecture means for us. So it's in Ljubljana, in uh, the uh, city center, very close to the city center, but uh, in the structure that appears and it is completely rural. This is the, the architectural faculty, and and this is so-called Krakovo, a little kind of uh, neighborhood uh, within the center of Ljubljana. And this used to be a village that was catering all the food in former times for the nearby monastery called Križanke. This is, and, and Križanke is the open, or, open air festival uh, hall right now that was renovated by Jorze Plicznik as his last uh, kind of executed work. So the, the li little neighborhood looks like this. And uh, it is, of course, under the protection of a, of a national heritage committee. Uh, but at the same time, we were kind of addressing this existing house that has nothing to do with the heritage at all. So we managed through, I think there were like more than a year and a half process to convince the heritage committee that we can do something which is a contemporary approach to renovating the, 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 the building within the heritage context. So we ended up with, uh, with uh, building this project, which is, you know, we torn down the, the, the existing building and we built it anew, but within absolutely the same uh, uh, dimensions. So the, the gabarits were completely fixed by the previous house, but kind of opening up a possibility to live on the upper floor. And since the the building used to be kind of the service building. It didn't have direct sunlight. So we kind of opened up and did a trick with the, with the roof window uh, where the, the so-called roof erker or something like that kind of goes out. It doesn't have the window here in this side, but we kind of reversed it and we put the window on the top. This kind of allowed the light to kind of come in and of course also gain space uh, within uh, the upper floor. So this is how it looks like. Um, we, uh, as, as it used to be a corrugated uh, fiber cement panels, the ones with asbestos that we kind of safely uh, stored and put away, we used uh, the Ethernet plates. And those were the times where Ethernet was still producing um, the, those panels that you could see the natural structure of fibers and cement on the foreground of the panel. I mean, I don't think that you can get this one off the market right now, unless you kind of reverse it on the other side. But that's another discussion. So as it was kind of our first building, we were drawing details by running through the building site. Um, and we gave uh, quite a lot of thought into, into detailing. Here, completely redefining the window with a contemporary architectural detail, kind of crafts detail. Um, having the glass exactly the same size as the previous window was, 
and then adding another element for ventilation. And sadly enough, I mean, in his, in here in this image, you see in the reflection of the glass one of the existing original windows that is it is protected that it should be protected by the heritage, but all of those windows were removed uh, throughout the little neighborhood, and they were kind of replaced with a generic plastic windows which are kind of double glazed and recessed from the facades. So our kind of contemporary version of the window, which is flush with the facade, is nowadays the only memory of those original windows that were, in a way, kind of completely flush with the, with the facade. So coming to the interior, uh, it is, it is uh, in a way, exposing the, the natures of, uh, of the materials with uh, visible concrete on the only wall that actually is structurally out of concrete. All the other ones are... Uh, brick mensary, um, but also kind of understanding what the staircase, what the role of the sta or staircase is. It's not really kind of just simple um, um, functional element that brings you from down to, to up, but it's also performing as a sculptural piece. And originally we wanted to paint this white, and then when we went to the building site where the guy was doing that, the, 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 the welder, we understood that it, the, by painting those uh, those stairs, we would completely cover his story or his kind of um, contribution to the element where you could see how it was welded and brushed off and so on. So at the end, we decided again on the fly to keep it like this. Um, and this stair kind of bring you up to the upper floor where there is like a simple plywood panels uh, uh, laid down uh, as, the, as the flooring. Uh, but we also used a lot of uh, uh, terrazzo material. And back then, Ljubljana was renovating all the Plechnik's works, if you imagine the, the market. So there were really a lot of uh, skilled people m m being, uh, being kind of on the market. They were really good with dealing with terrazzo. And that was, in a way, an inexpensive option back then for us. So I, I'm saying this because the building of this house kind of cost it all together, including with the kitchen and everything, 62,000 euros, okay, 20 years ago. So um, this is how it performs even today, although there's a little bit more furniture. And this building, in a way, defines how we think architecture also today with the projects that we are developing today. So this is a book that where we compiled all of our kind of homes for, for our friends, or the clients that, you know, you do the home for them, they become friends. Um, and here are also three other homes that I'm going to run through now. So uh, the home is always kind of the same program, but it's radically different because it's, again, completely different context and for completely different people. So here is just a, an experiment of running through these three homes in a parallel where you see that they are different because they have three completely different contexts, uh, completely different, in a way, cultural background, uh, three different types of, um, of references. Um, uh, they become different spaces, different materiality for different specific people, for their specific needs that are, of course, very different from each other. And therefore, they become different architecture. So Chimney House was erected halfway to the Mediterranean part, from Ljubljana to Trieste, let's say. In, uh, in a context of an edge of a dispersed village. And this is, um, this is what defines this house what it is. First, the couple who, who we made this house for, they were really keen on cooking with the original or the traditional stove on fire. So the fire was in a way heart of the, of the house, but at the same time, the fire also needs a chimney. So the chimney is always, it, it, here it was kind of extracted as something that defines the, the shape of the house. But on the other hand, the cultural context, we found really nearby a barn. And here you see this picture of the barn and you see it here behind, which kind of defines the materiality of the outdoor envelope in order to kind of fit in the village. So the, the chimney kind of defines the section uh, from the generic uh, double-pitched roof into something specific that uh, kind of runs the section throughout the whole building. Um, the floor plan is relatively simple and uh, one space of living, but we have put all of the 
all of the services to the wall. So it's kind of a, the concept of the thick wall. So this is how the building uh, stands on the edge of the village. And you see that there are some buildings that are kind of not really contextual to the traditional values of how the architecture has been built there. But in a way, we argue that uh, in, in, in with, with this building, we kind of fix the facade to the, to the, to the village that needs to communicate um, with the nearby church. So it is very much kind of a monolithic volume, but perforated with different uh, openings where you can connect with the nature and the view from both sides. And as the wall is like very, very thick, we used these uh, relatively small windows in a traditional way with kind of opening the sides. So the views can be running uh, through also at a certain angle, at the same time you get enough light. But the main light is coming through the gap in between the reach of the double-pitched roof, where the chimney is kind of exiting, but also allowing the nature of the sky and the stars coming into this uh, big, uh, very well-lit space. And the same thing kind of, um, kind of repeats itself in the master bedroom. Um, so, materially wise, we wanted to kind of run the same material since here up you, 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 it's a piece of the facade and here it's a piece of the facade and it has to be kind of continuous with the roof. Um, and we took uh, large and we stained it with uh, dark, almost black oil with only one go, so it kind of uh, makes this uh, a little bit um, variating. Um, already worn off uh, 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 color scheme. But at the same time, we used uh, inside oak for the floor and all of the cupboards. Um, these are all surfaces that you can touch, that you have tactility with, with when, when you're living. But the, the, f the ceiling or the slab, which is performing as a one huge truss throughout the building, uh, it's out of concrete, obviously, for the structural reasons, but we kind of imprinted uh, some wooden planks on there, so the texture of the wood is kind of wrapped all around. So eventually your gaze turns up to the, to the sky where you also get the light in. So the second house for, for, for another person is a compact karst house, being already placed at the Mediterranean in a completely different context of the church. The karst region, as you might know, it is uh, characterized mostly by, by, by stone and by, with this kind of very compact uh, villages that are protecting themselves from uh, the wind uh, called Buria or Bora. Um, and we were kind of faced with this kind of uh, uh, landscape. But at the same time, the typical karst house, it is almost as a manifesto of monomateriality. Even the ducts of the water, they're done out of stone. Um, there was practically, I mean, all of the wood went to Venice, so the stone was what was left. Um, and, but the other, on the other hand side, it is also a very small volume, just kind of protecting the people living there from the environment. And we took this material context and this kind of mono-volume context into the building that we have designed. It's a very small one and compact with, uh, with a floor plan like this, where the space flows through in, in, in a perpendicular way and the programs are kind of laid down uh, in an axial way with two uh, little kind of private spaces that you can call bedrooms uh, in upper floor and the shared space in between. So as this is one volume house, it also kind of repeats a mini house within with a smaller volume. So this is how the family is living now there with a kitchen on one side and the main space that kind of connects to both sides of the, the nature. And again, the staircase is something that kind of exceeds just the mere function of going up, but it doubles as a little library for the work uh, office space. And when you go up, you have this kind of shared space where kids can do their, well, they started with one kid, now they have two, and we are making plans for another house, it will be bigger. So they are here in a shared space, but um, when you kind of enter into the room, you face yourself with the same kind of very traditional double-pitched roof that actually within your room, private room, represents the same, uh, the same volume as you kind of 
understand outside as uh, the identity of this house. So it is, it is a very compact, small house with uh, an interesting take on the materiality. Of course, it is out of stone, but not in the way, in, in traditional way, how the stone was kind of laid together to be also structural. It is a combination between uh, concrete and stone that I'm going to explain. So first, the roof. Uh, the roof traditionally was made out of platy limestone, and that's, that's a resource which is kind of protected nowadays, geologically. So you cannot get it anymore. So we kind of figured it out how this, uh, this this platy limestone, uh, which kind of goes on the roof as a, as, as a covering element, can be reworked in a contemporary material, which is concrete. So we made this kind of steps. We made a couple of uh, experiments. And then we kind of laid out the, the steps one by one each day in order to create uh, the same, let's say, uh, mechanics of the water going down, using all the kinetic energy to not overflow uh, from the edge, but kind of go into the, the gutter at the edge of the house. Um, with with uh, the stone on the facade, as I said, we are challenging the material on site. So that stone that was found by the excavations was not really cultivated stone, but it was easy to find one relatively flat surface. So we made the formwork, uh, as you see here, and we kind of used those relatively small, semi-big stones to put them with a flat face on the, on the formwork and put the concrete in the back. So in that sense, we have got this uh, uh, complete, uh, in a way, monolithic house that kind of combines the concrete as a modern stone, although it's a little bit a cheesy word, and the stone itself to present a monomaterial uh, version of the contemporary local building, let's say. So the third one is a cliff top house on Maui. So we are moving to a completely different part of the world, to Hawaii. It's 12 hours time difference. And obviously the context is completely, uh, completely changed. Uh, Maui, it's a, it's a surface paradise, especially North Shore, where the trade winds are coming in. Uh, the, the surfers are being here uh, the most popular uh, population in a way. No? Um, so our client and a friend, Robert Stroy, he is a designer of Neil Pride uh, um, surfing sails that some of you might be familiar with. And obviously, as Neil Pride is a very big uh, corporate, well, global company with based in Hong Kong and production in China, the research laboratory is on Maui because it, the wind is good for testing every day. So Robert went around and found uh, an interesting plot for uh, his house to be built, and they gave us a reference. I mean, there was a brief of one page of you know describing I need the bath bathroom, bathroom bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, and so on and so on. So a generic material, but uh, um, a generic brief, but at the same time also an interesting reference to Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Carmel uh, building in uh, Walker's, Walker's residence in, in Carmel in California. Um, starting from Frank Lloyd Wright understanding what are the important uh, features of you know flying roofs and the floor plans, which are using 60 degrees ang angles, we, we went there and analyzed of what the site could give us. So we kind of tried to create certain direction of where you see the, 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 the view of the ocean, where you see the view of the mountain. And we came up with this kind of very conceptual model of private spaces being enclosed by this uh, three walls, a little bit kind of opened up, so you, you are more part of the outside than the inside, and the in-between space that uh, was supposed to be, in a way, the outdoor, indoor living. So on top of everything, we kind of placed a roof, which is kind of just combination, or kind of connecting all of those spaces underneath, becoming a version of a uh, landscape. Not literally, but more in a metaphorical way. So the building uh, works without any mechanical uh, uh, appliances. So we are using trade winds to ventilate the, the space. But at the same time, being constructed with this kind of mini volumes can work as a 
family home where every member of the family has its own room, but it also works as a mini hotel. You can imagine that quite a few people are visiting Maui very often, and uh, up to three families can live in this building with normally kind of sharing the spaces of uh, living, but being in private enclosed spaces um, individually. So these are the spaces the, that are kind of enclosed, including the, the, the service spaces and the space which is, which is uh, meant to be a kind of indoor-outdoor living, although it's covered with the roof, but just glazed off. Uh, on top of it, this is 250 square meters, and there on top of it is 500 square meters big roof, which means that there is double the surface of outdoor space, but covered from the sun and rain. So this is how it looks like. It doesn't really have a facade. We never really draw a facade because it only kind of represents itself by the roof. And it is kind of designed bottom up or from the inside to the outside. So what is most important to perceive is how you perceive the building or the house. You perceive it within the inside being kind of framing these views to the, to the ocean in such a way uh, with the front deck, or where you kind of m move through the threshold of being inside to kind of being in between to being part of the, the, the nature and the ocean. And even when you kind of come in from the back with the car, you immediately see the best uh, asset of the building, which is this magnificent view of the Pacific Ocean, and you can you know, do whale watching on in, the, in February and March. Uh, where the whales are being there. So materially, it's structured um, in a very kind of ordered way. So we've only used uh, two types of woods. One is the so-called ipe, or they call it iron wood, which is a local wood, but, uh, but it's prohibited to harvest it on Maui, so it was shipped from Brazil in a container. Um, and we used it for the ceiling and the floor and all of the cladding of the roof. On the other one, the hand side, you have uh, bamboo plywood, which is used for everything that is kind of moving, so all the doors and cabinets and so on. Um, and in between, these walls are being rendered with the, with the, um, with the render that actually combines a bit of limestone, a lot of uh, sa beach sand, and some cement. So in, uh, in uh, we had this article in Monocle where also the clients were interviewed and they, they kind of stated their uh, vision. No? Their vision was not to use any paint anywhere in the house. So this kind of went very well with our perception of materials and exposing their natures. So this is how you see then the materials are kind of aging and kind of transforming themselves. So that's the same type of wood, but one being used inside with the oil and the other one being used outside again with the oil, but under the weather it performs completely differently. So eventually you get the ipe wood, which is a local tree that with time gains, gained the same uh, the same chromatics as you see on the cliff down there. Although there are different materials, chromatically they become kind of one. So this is how this building kind of fits into the, into the context of this cliffy area. So eventually we ended up also on the cover of Dwell uh, mag magazine with a meaningful <coughs> name. Um, so this is now kind of about the home. Um, but with homes, and although we've done, we've done a couple of uh, collective housing projects as well, which I'm not showing today, um, we can improve uh, individual lives. But on the other hand, we are also kind of uh, obliged as architects to work towards improving the private, uh, sorry, the, the, the public life. Um, and with public projects, we see the opportunity to kind of influence the society to change for the better through architecture. So to start off, I would like to show quickly um, a, a competition that we have won last, week, last year. It's a science center in Ljubljana. It was a public competition um, um, with, uh, with international jury and international also entries. 
that we were blessed and lucky to, to win. So it is on the, on the, on the edge of the, of the center of Ljubljana, the, the small house is here, um, in, in, in a way in this kind of triangular park. So we understood the brief, we took it over, and we created this diagram uh, saying from the atom to the planet. Um, showing that the, the science center has to kind of cover a very wide range of topics, but at the same time has to be very versatile. So we reorganized, so we organized the program that have been given us by BRIEF in circles. Uh, and we assigned to each program a space that was required. So in a way we created this kind of circular repertoire of spaces that we kind of put together as a catalog, we put together in a program pavilions to the science uh, center. So it has kind of main volume, main cylindrical volume for the main space, and then some kind of satellites or atoms, if you want, of smaller spaces of these circular um, pavilions. Um, and all of this is kind of connected with the common roof that, uh, that kind of brings the program of all the pavilions together. Um, it also has some sense because all of these color-coded programs, they can work either together in one entity or each one of them separately with separate timings, which means that as a science center can also kind of survive economically to even rent out pieces of their, uh, of their building. So it is uh, a public space. The ground floor is permeable public space that connects also to the the local community to the other parts of the local city and you enter into it like this um, and then we on the competition level we always kind of create a couple of sketches in order to show how the building works that also work works from the other side when the kids are coming with the buses with organized uh, trips from schools and the foyer can uh, bring all of these programs together and you can decide which pavilion you are going to depending on your uh, on, on your wishes, um, or to go up uh, to the terrace where it's already kind of the view to the castle. Ljubljana is so small and we have mostly one or two references for, for making the visual connection and castle is one of those with the castle hill. But also being on the terrace uh, with, uh, with the restaurant and, uh, and the fab lab which kind of overlooks the main exhibition hall and eventually you can kind of enter on the roof, which is an outdoor uh, science exhibition space that again connects to the context of, uh, of Ljubljana. So this is uh, how it's envisioned the big, um, the big um, exhibition space of sciences with the fab lab being kind of hidden in the trusses that, uh, that go over this huge span of 40 meters. So, this is being now in progress, so next time when you visit Ljubljana, maybe in a year or two, I hope I can invite you to visit this building live. But to see how, uh, how we have done and trying to kind of influence society through our public buildings, I'm going to show you quickly these three projects. Um, starting with a metal recycling plant, an industrial facility where uh, the, 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 where the on-site recycling of metals is uh, being uh, run. So it mostly consists of one big plateau where all the machinery and, and, and all the recycling waste is being stored. And you know, the architecture in a way plays a very small, almost insignificant role. But it is two small buildings and we have decided to do these kind of two buildings in such a way that uh, each one of those represents a completely different program and therefore also a completely different material. But in the size, they are the same. So in terms of the brief, it was very simple. The truck comes in, either brings some waste material or it takes away some valuable materials. Uh, it being, it's being waste and uh, the, the building is in a way the control deck over that uh, process of taking in and out. So eventually also the waste overgrew the building and that's kind of a moment of insignificance of architecture sometimes. But as I said, there are two same, uh, same sized buildings in a completely different material because one um, is uh, only 100% metal structure and cladding because it contains um, all, uh, all the kind of soft programs, so all the specific programs that eventually might change with the technology. 
And the other one is a very simple and rough concrete building that houses a very generic program, which is a workshop to repair all the trucks and all the sanitary facilities for all the workers on the plateau. So in that sense, they already speak about the separation based on the different programs. So this is how it, uh, how it performs visually towards the public, uh, one being very kind of communicative, the other one being very silent, uh, but both uh, in a way serviced for the big plateau where the, 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 the process of recycling goes in. And there are these kind of wrong dimensions that we try to uh, also kind of incorporate in the building details. So here we were thinking about sustainability uh, more as a strategy, strategy uh, or ecological attitude or as opposed to you know, preferences over certain materials. And we thought that uh, in a way if the building is completely out of steel, the one that is going eventually to change to the technology of recycling can turn to this, to this and back to this on the site and there is another opportunity for another piece of architecture. So the second one is uh, campus, it's university campus in uh, a very small coastal town in uh, Isola on the top of the of, uh, Istrian Peninsula uh, where we also won a competition uh, for the big campus that was housing from the communal programs like uh, the, the, the head of, of, of the of the university to several faculty buildings. Um, we took the reference of, um, of Freie Universität from Berlin, from uh, Kandilisch, Josic, uh, Woods, um, in the, they, were, the, they were doing it in 73, which was embedding the concept of growing university because our uh, requirement, but also our proposal to the client was that the, 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 um, the campus should not be one big building, but it kind of should grow out of smaller buildings in order to be also able to, to do it in phases. So this was the, the scheme that we proposed uh, of the faculty buildings being, being kind of laid out in a, in a diagonal way over the plot, but at the same time having these kind of gaps to allow the city to go through the university also being part of the city, not kind of enclosed campus. So proposing phasing ends up that we were only able to do the first phase, and that's only one building that we've kind of constructed. And as it, uh, as it is designed, it's kind of two slabs with two entrances, so the public can also go through the building uh, with, uh, with, uh, with this kind of foyer and the two kind of cores that bring you up to the upper floors. And in the upper floors, you have this kind of public circulation with the elevator, with the two shared rooms, and then the facilities for the students. In the section, there are small two uh, um, lecture halls with the technology, uh, but the most important thing is that the people can kind of go through in a public way through this public uh, foyer with uh, several uh, stories high uh, space in between. Okay, so this is how it kind of works in clearly Mediterranean context. That's why it's in a way very closed off and it shows two faces. One is very kind of uh, secluded from the sun and we've used these windows to be pushed out so we don't have any, any shading outside with it would come to be operated, but the windows itself, they provide, they provide the shade from, from the sun, uh, from the south sides as they are uh, focus to the north side. On the other hand, this kind of uh, uh, decomposed patio in between opens itself with a glass facade with uh, fixed louvers to, for, for, to allow the, the visual communication within, within the building uh, itself. So an entrance and then the, the public space with a double height floor um, and we argued that uh, university as such, or this is a faculty for sciences, it kind of bases on communication between different departments to share their knowledge and discoveries. So all of the walls that are enclosing laboratories and uh, offices, they're out of glass. So eventually you can see from one side of the building to the other side of the building in order to 
promote this communication and share knowledge. So this is how it looks like with uh, the students being there uh, performing and the laboratories uh, being lit uh, with a very even um, dispersed uh, diffused light. And we invited, uh, sometimes we work, uh, we, we, we would like to work to, with, with, with uh, artists and uh, this is um, an artwork from uh, Matej Andras Vugrincic. He is collecting everyday objects and then putting them into a large proliferation, large number, creating something completely different uh, than the object itself. So we asked him to collect something that represents science and he collected uh, in this way with the, with the graphite uh, pencil different types of measurements that you can find, I find either on tape measure or on bottles or so on and so on. So we ended up with this huge collection of different measurements and we, we, we cut them out from the foil uh, and glue them on the, on the glass. So it kind of still remains transparent but provides certain, certain division from one space to the other one in a way through the art piece representing the science, which is kind of measurable. Um, we used the, the, um, the local tree um, in, uh, in, in the big, uh, in the big uh, classrooms or, or lecture halls, um, which is, again, not kind of lacquered at all. It's just simply oiled. And when you enter this, uh, this space, you have this very, uh, very kind of clear smell of, of the local pine tree. Um, it's kind of not very used material. The pine tree, it has a lot of uh, jinx and so on. But if you are using it in a way that uh, creates another atmosphere for you as a visitor, then it's a very, very uh, grateful material in such a way. Okay. So the last project I'm sharing with you is uh, it's a cultural uh, center for European space technologies. So this project has been designed and developed by four architectural offices in collaboration, which are Belk Perovic Architects, uh, Office Architects, Sadr Vuga and us. And uh, we were kind of invited to approach to this, uh, to this building uh, firstly, as, as a competition. And then at the end, we were kind of offered that maybe it would be an interesting moment to, instead of competition, doing a collaboration. So we kind of went uh, all in, and it turned out as a very interesting experience. And also, it set a new standard in Slovenian architectural scene that buildings in collaboration can be done and can be successful. Um, out of this, quite a few collaborations with other projects have been going on in Slovenia after that. Um, so this is, this is uh, a strange program that I'm going to explain, but put into a, uh, a, an environment uh, of a village of Vitanje, which is in a way halfway from Ljubljana to Maribor. So it's so-called the region of Pohorje, which is very hilly, uh, uh, region and being in a way kind of out of ordinary routes and not very well connected infrastructurally to other uh, uh, mid-sized cities like Celia and so on. Um, so the building has been erected there because the community of Vitania gave their existing, um, existing uh, community center, building of the community center, to be torn down in order to erect this building, but at the same time also to bring in their community uh, programs. So in a way, the building is two in one. One is the science and research center for space technologies, and the other one is the community building for the, the local inhabitants. So it it's kind of represents itself like this. It is very strange in the context of the whole village. Uh, which is dominated by the main church, which is on the little hill. But at the same time, it kind of provides a dialogue with the church. On the one hand, you have religion with representation of the church, and on the other hand, you have the science uh, with representation of this, uh, with this uh, cultural building. So why is it there? This is 
Hermann Potochnik Nordung that was born in Pula, uh, died in Vienna, and it was Austro-Hungarian rocket engineer and pioneer of cosmonautics of Slovene ethnicity. So he was practically in, in, employed in ballistics of Austro-Hungarian army. But besides that, he wrote a very interesting book in 1929. It was published in Berlin. Uh, the book was titled, written in German, but titled The Problem of Space Travel, the Rocket Motor. So apparently, this is one of the first books that speaks about space travel, the human space travel, through science instead of through imagination. And besides kind of putting all the words there, he uh, designed these kind of diagrams where he kind of represented spaces like mini architectures that could be used to travel in space. Or this is uh, the scheme of a heat pump to provide the energy or a full on design for an architectural piece uh, where people can kind of survive in space. And of course, you designed in that way that produces artificial gravity. As you know, the human body without gravity wouldn't really last for a long time, as we know from astronauts. So that was the main uh, kind of diagram that we kind of took off as uh, four collaborating offices in order to represent it as in the building. So in a way, it was kind of an easy start that we decided that it's going to be round. <clears throat> Um, Hermann Potochnik Nordung and his book has another, uh, another influence and uh, it has an influence in the pop culture. You might remember Stanley Kubrick's the groundbreaking film, the 2001 Space Odyssey, where, um, where he, uh, the Stan Stanley Kubrick, together with Arthur C. Clarke, who were writing the screenplay together, Arthur C. Clarke knew about this book about Hermann Potochnik Nordung, and they used this design to have the scenery in, in the movie. So that kind of brings Vitanie, who was kind of claiming that uh, part of the family of Hermann Potochnik Nordung originates from there, and uh, the book of, uh, of Nordung speaking about science, and this kind of pop culture uh, impression of uh, 2001 Space Odyssey compound a really kind of interesting um, connection within uh, Vitanie being somehow connected to the global society. So this is how the building represents. Let me walk you through. Uh, here you have the ground floor. Uh, with the main uh, circular hall where, where it's mainly meant for the local community, but also the entrance with the local library and uh, other spaces for local community. And it looks like this. Um, then you have the exhibition space, which is kind of wrapped around the cylinder and it's being tilted uh, in a ramp. So it challenges your notion of gravity because when we walk on the flat surface, we are absolutely not aware that there is gravity and our body works hard in order to keep us straight. But as soon as you start walking on the, on the slope, you start to consciously know that there is something going on and you are aware about the gravity. At the same time, the space is kind of a never ending, which kind of revolves around the main cylinder. And then on top of the, of, uh, the, the, the big hall, are spaces for space researchers with their own glass cubicles or cylinders that are kind of connected through the holes in the roof with the sky and of course getting the skylight in. So at the end when you go through this building uh, you end up your tour on the rooftop uh, where you can reconnect back to the to the nature and the town of uh, Vitania. But not to go down the same way we have designed the the fire escape, not the fastest way coming down, but it's orbiting uh, through the big cylinder in order to kind of touch ground on the other side of the building again, which is another experience of orbiting and you know kind of reaching different places of this building. So it's a complex uh, section which allows for such views to up or such views for the performances uh, seeing down. This is. Uh, Kodak, uh, a Swiss 
uh, performance group where singing on, on the robot hands, where they're kind of moving their bodies, and that's also how it performs a different way of uh, sound. Um, and and what, what is interesting at the end, when this building was erected, it attracted 24,000 visitors uh, first couple of years. And Vitania, as a small town, has only 800 uh, inhabitants. So uh, we have identified an open need and also an exposed potential of Vitania to become a case study for a set of bottom-up strategies and prototypes to challenge the conventional notion of tourism. So it was a mini Bilbao effect. And of course, it kind of created certain social tensions. So this is why we have started with uh, nanotourism as a topic of research in this building um, that is still running today. So that was seven years ago. Let me just say, to tell you a couple of things about nanotourism. So nanotourism is something that we have kind of put forward as a constructed uh, term describing creative critique to the downsides of conventional tourism. And I would like to say that it's not about scale, but it's more a projected ability to construct responsible experiences from the bottom up and using local resources. And maybe it's also beyond tourism being more an attitude to improve specific everyday environments for visitors and locals alike. So the pro this is in a way school, architectural school. Each year we are having roughly 15 to 20 students and each year we are creating some kind of um, um, well, examples of creating critiques critiques towards the tourism as we know it, with one-to-one -one prototypes that can uh, change your perception of visiting spaces. Um, this is our web page where we have the repository of the projects, and I would like to show you a couple of uh, um, uh, experiments or prototypes, how we challenged the building and the Vitania. Uh, so one uh, student group asked uh, themselves, what do we have in common in outer space and on the Earth. And obviously, these are basic human needs. And one of the basic human needs is sleeping. Um, and we sleep uh, at home in uh, two dimensions because our beds are flat. But the astronauts are in space where there is no gravity. The sleeping is being performed differently. So it came to the notion of the 3D sleeping. So doing a couple of prototypes of how this could be done within the exhibition, like spend the night in a museum type of thing, to a prototype like this where you could be kind of hung in the middle of the space in a, in a machine in a way that kind of connects all of your limbs together uh, in, with the equal weight, so it kind of creates this kind of weightlessness uh, uh, moment or a feeling uh, for you to kind of experience this very strange way of sleeping or at least resting. So this is how it kind of worked, and uh, it created this kind of uh, experiences or, 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 or feelings. So Xeut kind of became a hotel, as a very special version of hotel. And of course, this was a criticism towards the idea of uh, the mayor, who obviously, with so many visitors, wanted to build a hotel. And we tried to show it with this kind of very experimental and kind of artistic project that it, building a hotel, it's not the way to solve this problem or to kind of, you know, make economy, that you have to make something specific, which is only possible there with this context. So the other project, and one of, we, we were there for three years. Another year, we were collaborating with a nearby winery, Zlatigric, um, with uh, a sommelier, who introduced us into the ritual of wine tasting. Uh, and this student uh, group was mapping down what are the steps of the ritual of wine tasting, and they created a completely different version of wine tasting when you don't need a glass, because the, in gravity, the glass is kind of, uh, well, in zero gravity, the glass is useless. So they created this type of prototype of a suit with uh, tubes being laid out around your body where you inserted uh, a glass of Cabernet Sauvignon into the system and then you had to kind of perform a dance moving your body almost as you were in the zero gravity space in order to allow the wine to run through all of the tubes to mix with the air and so on to finally kind of give a sip. Um, another example was 
uh, was a dining experience in Xeut. Again, in collaboration with a, a chef of a nearby lo uh, local restaurant, but under the presumption that, again, what does it happen if we give way of all of the dinnerware, except for the napkin, as it happens to, to, to astronauts in space? So this student group, together with the chef, created an experience of dining within the building that uh, eventually, for the final jury, the chef came in and uh, applied on uh, you know, just a memory of, uh, of uh, dinnerware. Um, this is a mushroom soup uh, that it was kind of served with everything that comes together in such a way. And in the final jury, we were the test group in order to consume the, 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 the whole uh, course uh, in a very special way, creating another opportunity of how you can combine local knowledge and a crazy program of a crazy building. Um, this is Jakob Traunik, who we are doing together the school, a now tourism visiting school since uh, 2014, uh, taking a bite of a local sausage. Um, so just to kind of finish up another minute, uh, it happens that we were doing the AA nanotourism uh, in uh, Vienna this year uh, also with uh, Amanda Speger, um, who are both helping us to kind of do this uh, in, in Vienna. And we kind of teamed up with uh, Vienna Design Week to do such an experiment here in Vienna, which has kind of ended up uh, last week with our final presentation. Uh, and some projects, or most of the projects, were running through also the program of Vienna Design Week. So what are the nano strategies for Meidling? Meidling as a focus district from uh, Vienna Design Week. So we were, I must say, very lucky. And, uh, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful that we were kind of able to pull off the program in life with uh, students, roughly well, 20 students working there together an amazing uh, group of very ambitious students from TU, from Angevante, uh, and from Academy, but also some coming from uh, Ljubljana. This time it was kind of relatively local. And we also kind of exhibited in one of the rooms of Vienna Design Week. So we've done five projects for students uh, for, uh, per group. And I would just kind of like to show you quickly of what was one of the project. This is a project Urban Spa. We asked ourselves how can thermal sulfur water, once defining characteristic of Theresian Bad in Meidling, be reintroduced as a celebrated public resource of Meidling. Um, Meidling and uh, sulfur healing water was once on this kind of map that comes from Glognitz to Moravia, where all of these kind of spas are still today. But Theresian Bad is not today working with, uh, with uh, sulfur water. It, it's not there anymore, or at least in, uh, in Theresian Bad. So, but when you walk around Meidling, you see all of these kind of uh, artworks, uh, historical artworks on, on the facades that speak about water and, uh, and the bath and uh, the sulfur water. Um, in a way to, to, to understand that the history was actually quite rich in having the sulfur water in Meidling. Starting uh, approximately 200 years before Christ with, uh, with um, Roman uh, Empire having their, uh, how do you say that, um, well, an evidence of this sulfur water being found there. And then it was kind of lost and found the sulfur water springs through, throughout the history, uh, through Theresia and so on. And the last time it was uh, around 50s, still in Theresian Bad, uh, in such a way where you could actually, uh, this is the floor plan of Theresian Bad in Meidling that, uh, that shows one of the rooms where, where it was not just kind of a generic swimming pool as you find it today, but, uh, but you could kind of bathe in the sulfur water. It was kind of more or less individual experience with a bathtub and a little kind of resting bed. And as you know, Meidling is a very 
well, in my, the Theresian bath is kind of generic uh, swimming pool today, although that still kind of retains the name of Theresian bath. So where is the sulfur water in Vienna or in Meidling today? In a way, half by chance, half by employing all the senses, the student group found the sulfur spring water in one of the building sites, the biggest building sites in Meidling, where the construction has not really started yet, but it has a big uh, excavation uh, building pit. And the water that is kind of flooding into that excavation, it is the one from the sulfur, and they are pumping up through a filter over the Meidlinger Hauptstrasse uh, U-Bahn station and throwing it away to the Winfluss. And this is how they found it. They kind of smelled it, the sulfur, into in, in when they were coming out of the of the uh, U-Bahn. Uh, and the water, it's uh, it is by the um, by the list of the of the building site. Actually, the water which comes from the underground with rich with sulfur. So the student group kind of went into a research phase in order to understand what does this mean for Meidling, how you can represent it from being a wastewater of one building site to be a cultural representation of identity of Meidling with several prototypes of carrying the water across the city to the Theresian Bad, to trying to contain the water with the simple prototypes of, uh, of a red bucket over there in order to come to a conclusion or a solution that they need kind of two elements, same elements. One is a information giving kind of semi-furniture semi and the other one is a container of water. So this is what you find today when you go uh, to, to Meidling from, from U4, um, where you um, meet this kind of furniture which is neither a bench nor a table uh, nor a performance stage, but it gives you information, uh, written information about the culture of sulfur water in Meidling. So the counterpart on the second object is down there next to the Winfluss, which kind of catches the water and as the, the, the spring, the, this kind of mechanical spring of the water is not stable, it kind of runs for maybe two minutes and then there are like 20 seconds not running, the water kind of clears out and you see the written statement there, this could be a spa. So this is a representation or at least kind of a, a artistic call for attention that there is still sulfur water in Meidling that can be used and can be communicated in, uh, in a very different way. So this has been uh, run uh, through the past weeks of, uh, of guided tours from uh, Vienna Design Week in order to raise awareness. And here on the right, it's uh, the student group that has kind of created this uh, project. And the project was in a way, a very good prototype for some uh, Meidnigers or maybe Viennese inhabitants to, uh, to uh, rediscover the sulfur healing spa in Meidling and its own identity. So thank you very much for your patience and bearing with me tonight. <laughs>